Okay, good morning, everyone. We will go ahead and get started right at 1030 here. I did just um, hit the record button, just so you are all aware that we are recording this session. I am so happy to have you all here with me um, in this session, understanding the basics of trauma in a multi-tiered system of support. Um, so before we get started, I do just want to give a couple of quick notes. We will be going through the basics of trauma-informed education in a trauma-informed um, presentation where we really go into some background about adverse childhood experiences and how that affects brain development. And it can be a really heavy um, presentation to sit through. So I want you all to just make sure that you have, um, or you're keeping in tune with yourself, you're keeping check with yourself. Um, and if you need to pause and step away for a moment, please feel like you can do that. Um, we will have all of these slides available for you. All of the here we will have available for you as well. Yes, if everyone can, before we go through these slides, just um, make sure you are on mute. I think we're hearing a little bit of echo. If you need help with mute, just hit that, um, hit the mute button or the little, um, that little microphone on your Zoom screen. Okay, I think we should be good to go. My name is Elizabeth Suddeth, and I'm the Executive Director of Prevention Services and School Climate Transformation here at the State Department of Education, and I am lucky enough to work in the Office of Student Support. So student support is made up of a wide variety of expertise in our agency um, that really focuses on the well-being of the whole child. So we look at everything that is non-academic and how does that relate to the well-being of a student in the school. So we are able to do a lot of professional developments and that is one of my most favorite parts of this job is I get to exist as a resource for you all. Um, so please feel free to either write down my email address, you can find my email on our website, or again, you can click on it right here in these slides when um, these slides are available to you. But we are able, again, to go out and do professional development training with your school sites. We're able to come in and talk through some one-on-one -on -one coaching with you. Um, we're able to share all of our resources and all of um, the great things that we've developed over, over the last several years of being an Office of Student Support. So please feel free to reach out. We do have a team um, that can connect you to a variety of different topics. Oops. Okay, so the very first place that we are going to start today in this presentation is starting with us. So when we start talking about a lot of these topics, and as I gave you the warning at the very beginning, this can be a really heavy um, topic or presentation to sit through. But not only is it a really heavy presentation, it is something that we see every single day with our students in our school. And we need to know how uh, working with students and how especially working with students who experience trauma affects us. How are all of these things that we're dealing with every single day really affecting our mood and affecting how we are relating with students? So used to, or typically if you've sat through this presentation before, if you've gone to some trauma-informed trainings before, self-care was one of the very last things that I was, that I would talk about in a presentation. And it was typically if I had time to get there. And then I really started thinking, you know what? We need to start these presentations talking about self-care because it shouldn't be something that we get to if we have time. It's just something that is so important. And it is the entire heartbeat of the school is how the teachers and how your staff is feeling and how you're able to cope with trauma and how you're able to recognize your signs and symptoms if you are feeling stressed. So that's where I want to start with this presentation today. Starting with us, what can we do? What does staff well-being really mean? So what is self-care? So a lot of times when I hear self-care, people typically think, oh, oh, it's going to get a massage or it's going to do one of my just favorite activities. And that are, is a great self-care activity for you to do and you should do something you enjoy, but it really goes a lot deeper than that. 
Self-care is the practice in, um, of taking an active role in protecting one's own well-being and happiness, particularly during a period of stress. I don't know about you all, but I know that um, last year was a particular hard period of stress. Whether we all experienced trauma or a different level of stress during the pandemic, we all did have stress. That is something that we cannot get across enough. So while you are over the summer break, and I appreciate you all so much attending today in these engaged sessions, I really challenge you to take the time this summer and to stop and think, how did this last year affect me? How did my, how did this, or my entire career, how has it affected me? What am I really noticing about myself? And stop and think, how can I help protect myself going into this new school year? We're going into recovery mode. We are going into recovery mode with students. And if we have to start with ourselves. We have to take care of ourselves even before we step back into that classroom. It's the most important thing you can do for your students is to take care of yourself. And it's essential. Um, it's not only essential for how we are feeling, but really it's the antidote to professional burnout and compassion fatigue. So I implore you all to just stop and think, how am I feeling? What did I just go through? What did I experience? And how can I develop my own self-care plan? So that leads us to our first poll question. So we all went through the same storm this last year. We all were in different boats though. We all experienced this last year very differently. Even though it was the same storm, we're in completely different places. Some schools stayed virtual, some schools stayed open. But the thing that we all have in common is again, we were going through the very same stress. Your students were going through the same stress as well. And your students were all in different boats. Maybe you had some students who were just cruising right along, as you can see represented here in boat A, or maybe you had students who were just hanging on for dear life, as you can see in E or F. Maybe some students who felt completely alone, or maybe you felt like you were just speeding through the year, trying to get by and do the very best that you can. We were all in different boats. So I want you all to just stop, take a minute, and really think about where was I at this last year? And just focus on yourself during this poll question. So what boat were you in? You were in A, B, C, D, E, or F. And I'll leave this open just for a second. I see a lot of E's coming through. Okay, I'll give you about 15 more seconds to answer this question. Okay. Okay, it looks like E is the winner here. I feel like we were all just in this wild ride together. We were all just hanging on, trying to survive and trying to make it through. Seeing most of you in E and majority either um, C or below tells me we all did experience some stress and we all have some self-care to do. So developing your plan and knowing your next step um, is so important and so is crucial, especially going into this next school year. So I want you to think through this too. What boat were my students in? What boat did I see the most represented in my classrooms or in my school? Because we know that not every single student had the same tools for success or had the same tools for how to operate through this stressful year. So really keep this in mind, again, going into next year, what this might look like. 
and that every single student is just operating this same storm, but in a different boat. The storm may have been worse in some areas than others. So we have to see each student for what they just went through or what they've gone through in their life. So just keeping this same um, storm different boat exercise in mind as we're going into this next school year. And if you want to in the chat, I won't make you all come on and share with me why you selected the boat that you were in. But if you want to share in the chat um, why you selected that boat, I think that would be really interesting if we could have some of that conversation back and forth. So what can you do? The very first thing that you can do is increase your knowledge about secondary trauma, warning signs and its effects. So what is secondary trauma? It is watching somebody that you care about or watching your students go through trauma, hearing those stories every single day. You not only experience um, what you go through and the stress you went through either in this last year um, or working with students who've experienced trauma, the brain can actually hear those stories and start to relate and start to experience that trauma right alongside especially how much we care about our students. They are our family. They mean so much to us. Your brain really starts to associate their trauma or their stress as your own. So you have to be very mindful about how hearing all of these stories and going through all of these experiences are affecting you and looking out for some of those warning signs. Assess your current level of compassion fatigue. Are you feeling... I just can't take anymore. I just can't hear any more of these stories. I just can't do this anymore. If you're feeling that way a lot, you might be suffering from compassion fatigue. And that is a big warning sign um, that you're experiencing some of this chronic stress. Stay connected to your support system, whether it is your school support system or your family support system. That is the most important thing you can do is to share how you are feeling with others and staying connected, staying in the loop. It was really hard to be connected this last year, but I hope you all found different ways and found new ways of being connected. Um, and identify and incorporate self-care strategies that promote resilience. So resiliency is being able to snap back and being able to go through stress, but know that this stress isn't going to completely get me down. I have ways that I can bounce back from this. And there are a lot of self-care strategies um, that we have within this presentation. You can find many on different websites. And there's a lot of self-care toolkits out there, especially made for educators because we know that you are the heart and the heartbeat of what is going on in your communities and in our nation. Educators were there on the front lines. Educators, you are the ones who have been involved in every aspect and hear all of these stories. So that is why there are so many self-care resources and uh, toolkits out there for you all. Know that we care about you, know that we care about you taking care of yourself, and we just want to make sure that you have all of the um, necessary tools in your toolkit to be able to look and reflect, how am I feeling? How do I take care of myself in this moment? So you can also always, again, reach out to your, our office. You can reach out um, and look for any of these self-care strategies. We do have a full self-care um, staff well-being training that we are happy to come out and do with your school as well. Okay, so now moving on to talking about trauma responsive educators and trauma responsive education. So I'm about to go through the four R's of what it means to be a trauma responsive educator. And what you will find from these four R's is that this is how the rest of the presentation is laid out today. So the very first thing in order to be a trauma responsive educator, we wanna make sure that we realize we realize the impact of trauma and what that has on staff, student, families, and commu community members. So when we talk about trauma-informed schools, we're not just talking about trauma that students experience or individual trauma. We're talking about how trauma affects everyone around us, how trauma is affecting staff and communities in which we live. We have to first realize the impact. 
The second R um, is how do we recognize? So first we realize, then we move into recognizing the signs and the symptoms of trauma. When I see student misbehavior, am I seeing a student who is dysregulated? And is that dysregulation due to symptoms of trauma? So that is the second part of this uh, presentation. How do we recognize? And then how do we respond? We want to make sure we are responding in the re appropriate way. We're not just reacting to situations that we're seeing. Um, a, school members respond by integrating um, principles and knowledge of trauma-informed approach into the school-wide system. And then how do we resist traumatization or re-traumatization? A school system resists re-traumatization by minimizing unnecessary triggers for all members uh, through integrating trauma-informed approach in school policies and practices. As you will see, that re is in parentheses because we want to make sure that we acknowledge that trauma sometimes can happen um, at the school for staff or for students. So we're not always resisting re-traumatization. We might be resisting traumatization there as well. Okay, so our first R, how do we realize the impact of trauma? Understanding brain science of trauma. So this is where we always start with these presentations. What is trauma? What does that mean? And how does that affect the students that I see in the building? Well, what we know is trauma can be anything that changes the brain's development. Examples include abuse, assault, natural disaster, or the death of a loved one. But really anything can lead to trauma depending upon this person and the circumstance. So it's really important to understand that just because somebody has gone through a stressful or an adverse event does not necessarily mean that they have experienced trauma. That's why I said, you know, same storm, different boat. We have all just went through the same stress, but not every single person in this last year has experienced trauma due to that stress. We know that trauma is what is actually changing the way that the brain is developing. So it's important to understand the difference between chronic stress and acute stress. Chronic stressors are something that lasts a long period of time and that somebody is dealing with over and over. Acute stress is something that happens in a short amount of time in a small time period. So when we're talking about the way that trauma is affecting brain development, it's important to first start talking about how does the brain develop. So these are the three areas of the brain that we are going to focus on in this presentation. Now there's a lot more that goes into brain science than just these three areas, but that's what we will focus on here. What we know about the developing brain is that it starts developing from the bottom and works its way up to the top. The very first area of the brain that starts developing is this brain stem or this survival brain. The next area that starts developing is the limbic brain. And then the third area of development is the neocortex. So we know that the brain stem and the limbic brain is developing in utero. So even before birth, these areas of the brain are developing um, and are being influenced by um, factors. Elizabeth, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but we need Michelle, if you could please mute your microphone and anyone else that may have their microphone unmuted. We're getting a lot of feedback. I'm so sorry, Elizabeth. There's just lots of, of um, chatter in the chat about it. So you may have to mute them, Elizabeth. I don't have the, uh, I can't from my end. Okay. Let me see if I can from here. Okay, that should be better now. Thank you, Shelly. Okay, so the areas um, of development. So as I was saying, we know that um, in utero, the brainstem in the limbic brain is what is developing the most. 
And that is why um, all of those factors, even during pregnancy, can lead to the way that a brain is developing for a child. And the third area, the neocortex, is what is developing until the age of 24 or 25 years old. So that might make a lot of sense for some of the students that we're working with. We're, they're all under the age of 24 or 25. We're all working with a lot of tiny humans with not fully developed brains. So we know, again, that it's starting from the bottom, working its way up to the top. If you think about a student, who is in a safe and supportive and loving environment and meeting all of those social emotional milestones and have all of those basic needs met, you can think of that brain development as a straight line road. But if you think about a child who is living with a lot of um, adverse experiences, living with a lot of trauma, maybe abuse or neglect or some other experience in their life, you can think of that brain development, that straight line road, of having little forks in the road. So it is actually changing the way that the brain is developing those outside experiences. We know that there are new neural pathways that are different, you can actually see visible differences on brain scans um, of children who have gone through abuse or some sort of trauma versus those who have not. So again, when we say it is changing the way the brain is developing, brain science tells us it is actually changing the neural pathways in that brain. So what might we see? So you see over here, we have typical development versus um, development of the brain in trauma. So some of the largest areas that start developing um, in trauma is that survival mode. If we go back to this slide, that is what this brainstem area is, that survival area. This is where we see that fight, flight, or freeze. So this is the brain taking over and saying, we're in trouble, there's something going on here. I need to make sure we survive. And that is the area of the brain that is receiving um, the most activity. And that is the area of the brain that starts forming the most. We also see this limbic brain um, has a lot more activity, again, going to the emotions, going to the limbic brain. So we see a lot more neural pathways to that area. And then we see the social, emotional, and cognitive areas um, developing somewhat smaller as we work our way up. So again, it's the brain to going through all of these different experiences in life saying, I got to take over. I have to make sure we're okay. I have to survive because there's not that safe and nurturing environment. So a lot of times um, people ask me, so that means that adults can't experience trauma. And that's not what that means at all. So adults can definitely experience trauma, but we know that children are more susceptible to stress, rewiring the brain and um, turning into trauma because they are more um, open to those changes due to their developing brain system. So adults definitely can have that um, trauma effect and can definitely have changes in their brain due to trauma, but we know that students, we know that children are the most susceptible due to their developing brains. So this is a representation of um, what those neural pathways look like at birth. So we see there's not a ton of neural pathways. We know that in the first year of life, the brain goes through what is called a boom, and it just starts developing neural pathways um, at a rate that is not seen compared to at any other point in life. So the most neural pathways a child will have is that elementary age that you can see represented here in this middle column. All of these neural pathways are being built upon experiences and exposures. So again, think to students who have had a lot of adversity or have experienced trauma. All of their neural pathways are being developed in a chronic state of stress 
or even that acute state of stress. So those neural pathways are going to look completely different from student to student because we know every student is in a different boat. So by the time we, um, a child reaches puberty, that's when the brain starts going through a process called pruning. And it starts getting rid of all of these neural pathways that are no longer serving its purpose. So what a child goes through by the time they're puberty, the brain says, I'm not using this. I'm going to start getting rid of all of these pathways that I'm not using regularly. So if you have a child who is not regularly being able to have healthy coping or they're not able to have healthy social emotional development, those are some of the neural pathways um, that are being pruned away. So that is why it is so important to have trauma-informed schools as early as possible, especially by the time a child reach, it reaches puberty. We want to make sure we are building up all of these skills and that those neural pathways are the ones that are staying around um, that are being experienced the most. So we know that prevention, we know that as early as possible is the key to trauma-informed but we know it's not too late. If we start having trauma-informed, if we start um, having some of these um, interventions with students after the age of puberty, it is never too late. It is never too late, even into adulthood. That is the most beautiful part about education and about the brain and how it works. We can always rewire brains. We can always create new pathways. We can always get back to that straight line of development. It just takes teaching those skills. Okay, enough about brain science. Now we will move into the different types of trauma. And I promise that is all the brain science that I will talk about from now on, but that is just such an interesting part to me. So if that wasn't interesting to you, we will now move into more about the different types of trauma. So we know a lot of times when we're working with students, we automatically think of individual trauma. But there are so many other types of trauma, collective trauma, historical trauma, as well as intergenerational trauma. So we know that individual trauma refers to a traumatic event that occurs to one person. So it could be that it occurs to one person but affects everyone around, but that is still considered individual trauma. So again, a lot of times examples include abuse or um, neglect here, um, or some of those ACEs that we're about to go through in just a moment. So collective trauma refers to the impact of trauma on, that it has on communities, groups of people, society, or globally. So collective trauma is something that is larger that happens to a group, more group of people. So it can be include pandemics, can include war, terrorism, genocide, famine, extreme poverty is a type of collective trauma or systemic oppression. It's really important to expand the way we think about trauma. We have to look at the collective impact of all the students, again, coming into our building, all of the students who are in the same boat. What collective trauma did they experience together or have they experienced across the course of their lifetime? We also know that historical trauma um, it refers to collective trauma over time by a group of people who share the same circumstance, identity, culture, or affiliation. So historical trauma is something that is so important to talk about, especially in the context of Oklahoma, because we have very unique historical trauma that exists right here in our state that we are not that far removed from that we have survivors of this historical trauma and generations of those survivors still in our classrooms today. So we have to be very mindful when we talk about historical trauma, about how that affects, again, different students differently. Not every single student is impacted by historical trauma, but there are students in your classroom, in your schools, who are impacted still today by historical trauma. So just what is some of the historical trauma in Oklahoma? 
So we know the trail of tears. We are a state that was built upon trauma, a state that was built upon some of that historical trauma. What does that mean for students in your classroom? We, we just um, went through the 100 year um, of the Tulsa race massacre. What does that mean for generations that are still alive and going to our classrooms every single day? What does it mean for that group of students to not only be taught about this more, but to still have those stories passed down for generations and generations? So keeping in mind that those that trauma is still very, very real. The Dust Bowl is another type, that extreme poverty in Oklahoma that so many generations before us experienced as well. There's a lot of trauma when we unpack the history of Oklahoma. So just keeping all of those things in mind, this can be um, a presentation in and of itself. So intergenerational trauma is something that I'm also very passionate about talk, talking about when we're talking about the different types of trauma, because there's a lot of studies going on about intergenerational trauma and how it's affecting students today, students in our classroom. So we know that historical trauma impacts that collective group or um, those individuals who went through experiencing that, but what science is telling us is that it can also impact generations to come. So I said I was done with brain science, but here's just a little bit more. There are some studies going on that are so interesting right now, talking about the effects of students in the classroom of trauma that was experienced in previous generations. Some of the very first studies that um, went into this a little bit more was studies on Holocaust survivors and how that trauma that Holocaust survivors experienced was actually passed down through generations, not only through stories, but what they're finding is through the changes in the genes and the way that DNA is read and replicated. So they're actually finding genetic markers that changes in an individual when they're going through extreme trauma. And those changes in those genetic markers can be passed down through generations. So when students are sitting in your classroom and they're going through history lessons, just know that it might be something more um, than just something that um, ancestors or previous generations have experienced. Again, those changes in those genetic markers can be passed down from generation to generation. I highly encourage you all to go and do some more studying on intergenerational trauma because it is just so remarkable what they are finding um, through some of these studies and the way that it is affecting students today. So going through all of those different types of trauma, what I want you to take away from it the most is that we can't see trauma. We can't see changes in the brain. We can't see these different historical traumas or way intergenerational trauma is affecting our students, but we have to be mindful that it exists. We have to know that just because a student comes from a home that we believe is safe and caring, they could ex still ex have experienced trauma in their life. There are so many different types of trauma and we just have to look at uh, trauma even differently than we have in the past. So that leads us talking into a little bit more about adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. So I'm sure you all are familiar or have heard the term ACEs before, um, but I wanted to make sure we hit on this again, just in case you are not familiar or just a little bit refresher of what do we mean by adverse childhood experiences. So the ACE study first began in 1985 with Dr. Vincent Folletti. Dr. Vincent Folletti had a obesity clinic in San Diego. So what he noticed during um, his time as a um, in this obesity clinic is that participants were coming in and having great results, losing a ton of weight, and then as soon as they would go back into their everyday life, um, they would gain the weight right back. Or another what something else that he noticed is that they would get halfway through the program, have great results, and then just drop out. So he wanted to know, what is the psychology behind this? 
why when students or when participants are experiencing success, do they stop? Do they fall off or do they stop with the program? So he started conducting some face-to-face -face interviews. And it was during one of these face-to-face -face interviews that he had a light bulb moment. It was a young woman who had disclosed that she had been a survivor of sexual assault. And it was this sentence or this phrase from her, to be overweight is to be overlooked. And that's the way I need to be. And he stopped and he thought, this goes so much deeper for this patient than just losing weight. Losing weight became a part of her identity. It became a part of her defense mechanism. It became a part of her coping. It was as much as a part of her identity as anything else. So he took um, these face-to-face -face interviews to Dr. Robert Anda, who was at the CDC at the time, and decided he wanted to broaden the study. So they started interviewing people from all across um, and going through what is now known as um, the ACEs questionnaire. So this ACEs questionnaire was developed off of the 10 most um, experienced adverse childhood experiences. So this is not all adversity that a child has experienced in their life, but these are just the 10 most common that they selected for this study. Now, in recent years, there's been a lot of, um, a lot of, you know, attention around what is called the ACEs quiz. And I went to a training recently with Dr. Robert Anda, where he made it very clear that this is not a diagnostic tool. This is not a quiz to find your ACE score. This is a quiz that was used or a questionnaire that was used during a study to find how trauma affects individuals. So I want to make sure I make that statement because you can easily go and find these questions and find your ACE score, but it is not intended to diagnose. It is not intended to say you have experienced trauma. Again, it is just what was used in this study. So if you hear anything from ACEs or if you hear anything from these questionnaires, it is important to say we never recommend giving these questions to students. These are incredibly um, triggering questions, but it's also not a tool to diagnose any students. Um, so again, just to make sure that we understand that this was a part of this study, but questions that you can easily go and find. We do have a number of recommendations of how to universally screen students for trauma that I'm happy to share with you all, and I do have embedded in this. Okay, back to the ACEs question. So what we know is that adverse childhood experiences were divided into three different categories, abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. So there were three questions on abuse, physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, two questions on neglect, physical or emotional, and five questions on household dysfunction. Was there mental illness in the home? Um, was mother treated violently? Was there domestic violence in the home? There's a question on abandonment, whether that be divorce, abandonment of a parent, or that even goes into um, abandonment through either deployments um, or military families as well. There is also a question on incarcerated relatives and questions on substance abuse. So if an individual was taking this questionnaire and they said, yes, I've experienced physical abuse. Yes, I've experienced emotional neglect. And yes, there was mental illness in my home. They were said to have an ACE score of a three out of a 10. Now let's just pause here for a moment and talk about some of the statistics in Oklahoma. And what we even know statistics in the last year in Oklahoma. Abuse and neglect rates were on the rise. And I know a lot of you have been worried because you weren't there every single day to see your students or make reports that you normally would. So what does that mean going into this next school year about the abuse and neglect rates? We know domestic violence rates skyrocketed in our country and in Oklahoma as well. We know that neglect goes hand in hand with abuse. 
So oftentimes neglect is one of those first warning or red flags that there might be some abuse going on as well. We know that mental illness rates are on the rise as well and also access to services. Oklahoma was number one in the nation a few years ago for the rates of mental illness and the lack of services to receive treatment. We've always been in the top 10 for domestic violence and number one for the rate of women killed by intimate partner violence. We have one of the highest divorce rates in the nation as well, above the national average. We have one of the highest incarceration rates, but not only high incarceration rates, but we have the highest incarceration rate in the world of women incarcerated. And what does that mean for families? What does that mean for students that you work with every day? We also know that we have a really high rate of substance abuse here in Oklahoma. We have a high rate of opioid use, but also we're seeing as that opioid use is falling, that it's being replaced with um, meth use. We have really high rates of meth use here in our communities. Now, all of that is to not completely um, bum you out about Oklahoma or depress you about the statistics that we see, but it's so that we are aware that we know what students are experiencing, that students living in Oklahoma have a higher rate of having an A score just being born here, or a higher risk of having a, an A score just by being born here. We have to use these questions, we have to use these statistics as a lens in which we see trauma in our schools. I've done this trauma presentation for many years now across the state, and I have not had one person come up to me and say, not here, that's not our school. Our community does not deal with these problems. Every single time somebody comes up to me and says, you're talking about my community. You're talking about my students. I see this every single day. So it's important, again, to keep all of these things in mind. And what do we know about ACE scores? We know that there's a strong correlation to the higher the ACE score to the following issues. Social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, changes in the way that the brain is developing, adoption of health risk behaviors, disease, disability, and social problems, and early death. We know with somebody from the, this study that has an ACE score of six or higher has a lifespan reduced by as much as 20 years. Now, I actually have a background in public health and when we do research or when we do studies, we look at what does the lifespan, how is this affecting the quantity and quality of life? And if there was anything that came across in a study that said a reduction in a lifespan reduced by as much as 20 years, alarm bells would be going off all across the board. But we know that this data is here. And even when Dr. Vincent Floody and Dr. Robert Anda were going through this data, they couldn't believe it. This is the root cause. This is what we are seeing so much. And if we get to this level of prevention where we're intervening with trauma-informed schools, we get to this level of prevention when we can intervene with some of these ACE scores, then we see a reduction in all of these health risk behaviors. This is really some incredible data that they were able to find. So those with the ACE score of three or higher considered at risk for twice as likely to become a smoker seven times more likely to be an alcoholic, 10 times more likely to inject street drugs, more likely to be violent, have multiple marriages, more broken bones, more depression, more autoimmune diseases, and more work or school absences. Now, maybe this doesn't represent every single one of your students, but does this represent some of those students that have been popping into your head and the families maybe that they come from or the communities? in which you live. We know that ACE scores, again, is changing the way that the brain is developing if it is trauma. And that is what is leading to being at risk for everything on this list that you can see. We'll talk a little more about that here in just a moment. So what might you see in your classroom? Difficulty trusting others, social isolation, 
difficulty seeking help. Again, that survival area of their brain is so large that they have always depended upon themselves for survival. And if adults, adults are a reason for their ACE score, why would they trust other adults? We think that students should come into our classroom and know that we are safe. We are a caring environment. They should come in and behave and respect, but their brains were formed differently. Their brains are formed in that survival mode. And it's really hard to trust others when you have a very large um, um, survival mode area of your brain. We see increased medical, emotional, and mental problems, problems with coordination and balance, poor affect regulation, problems with academic achievement. That is one of the first red flag indicators that go off is if there's problems with academic achievement, there's probably something else going on there for that student as well. Now, I'm not saying problems with academic achievement equals trauma, but it is just something why universally screening for academic um, problems or where a student is academically is so important, especially when we talk about trauma-informed schools. We can pick up a lot of students just through academic screeners. Oppositional or antisocial behaviors and difficulty planning for the future. So what do we know about ACEs in Oklahoma? A Oklahoma has some of the highest ACEs in the United States. Nearly one third of children have experienced two or more ACEs. That's the highest rate in the country. And as you start moving up the ACE score four or more, five or more, Oklahoma is number one on that list. It's a national recommendation to assume that 45% of your students have an ACE score. So if that's a national recommendation, we know that Oklahoma experienced some of the highest ACEs in the nation. It is safe to assume that 45% of your students have an ACE score, if not more than that. And again, I have so many schools reach out to me and tell me, we think there are more than that. We know a lot of students are experiencing this. So before we move into trauma responsive schools and why it's so important and how you can set up your school in a way to respond to students who've experienced trauma, I wanna make sure and note that you do not have to know a child's ACE score. You do not have to know the history of a child, exactly their type of trauma, if it has changed their brain development in order to be a trauma responsive school. And that is something that is so great about this model that we are about to go through through. It does not mean diagnosing students. It does not mean finding out all of their history. But what it means is setting up a school system that responds to all students, that all students feel safe and protected. And when all students feel safe and protected, students who have experienced trauma feel safe and protected too. So what do we know are the benefits of a trauma-informed school? Moving a little bit into what's next? What do we do about this? Every time we go through the basics of trauma, that's the number one question I get is, okay, now what? What's next? What do we do about this? That is everything we're about to go through um, in the second part of this presentation. We know that there are improvements to academic achievement, to um, test scores go up. Teacher sense of satisfaction goes up. There's more safety in being a teacher when you have students who feel safe in school. We know that there's retention of new teachers. People want to go in and do their job. You have a more positive school environment when you have a trauma responsive or a trauma informed school. That is what is so important. When students show up, Students want to be at school. Students are more connected to school. That's why we see academic achievement and test scores go way up. So it's more than high quality instruction. It's about how the students are feeling, how they take in that new information. We know that it reduces student behavioral outbursts. So you have more time to do what you love. You have more time to teach because there are fewer behavioral outbursts. There's fewer um, dysregulated students in your classroom. We know that office discipline referrals go way down and stress for staff and students. 
Student bullying and harassment, these have also been very highly linked to um, ACEs. We know that student bullying goes down, absences, detention, that chronic absenteeism rate, it also goes way down when we have a safe and supportive learning environment. But why do we need trauma-informed schools? So research tells us that students who survive trauma and grow to be successful have identified a single variable, a caring adult who believed in them and who cared for their well-being. This is what education is all about. So if you're sitting through this presentation up until this point and you say, this isn't me. I'm not. I, I, I'm not a mental health provider. I can't undo all of the trauma. It's too big. Our students have gone through so much. How do we undo that? Well, that's where this research is so, so inspiring because we know that it can take just one adult. And educators, more often than not, are that one adult for students. We can undo, we can rewire the brain, we can help build protective factors for students just by being a safe adult in their life, by reaching out to the students who need it most, by being there. And that is the best part about education and being educators and something I'm so passionate about and why this profession is so important because we can be that next line of defense should students be learning this at home? Yes, of course. I would hope that every single student and every single child has that brain development that is meeting all of those social, emotional, and loving milestones, but not every single student is in the same boat. Not every single student is receiving that at home. We can be that safety net. We can be that safety boat that comes and gets these students and puts them on a different path that steps into their life and says, you are worth more, you are worth something. And if that is not inspiring, I don't know what is. Being an educator is that next step. It is that step that can completely change the trajectory of, an, of a student's life, of your classroom's life. There's so much that goes into this and all it takes is being a kind and caring adult. So why trauma-informed? Becoming trauma-informed re requires a shift in the paradigm of classroom management. It changes the way we think about interacting with students, how we think about setting up our classrooms, how we think about designing in high quality instruction, how we design every interaction we have with students. It goes against what you've learned about students' behavioral challenges and classroom, disrupt, or classroom discipline um, approaches. It changes how policies are developed and implemented in schools when encountering students who've experienced trauma. And it has a ripple effect across the entire environment and culture. It involves administration, teachers, staff, students, and families. It takes all of us, but we can all be that trusted adult. If we all are that trusted adult, we are all that trauma-informed adult then we can reach every single student who needs us. We can change that pathway for students. Because what we know is there's no greater intervention. I will go through a list of great interventions with you today, but there is no greater intervention than a student having a safe relationship. If you take away anything, take away this, there's no greater intervention than a student feeling safe. So let's do a quick activity um, where you can um, reflect by yourself or put into the chat. I want you to think about a teacher who impacted your education. What qualities did they represent? So if you would just start putting some of those qualities in the chat. So it could be positively impacted your education, or even negatively impacted your education? What qualities did they have? And I will pull up the chat and start looking through some of those qualities. Optimistic, yes. Compassion, empathy, loving, respectful. 
patient. Belief, yes. Went out of their way to be there for me. Genuine. Listen, fun. It's perfect. Yes, thank you. If you all would keep putting those in the chat. I love doing this activity in person. It's a lot better to do all of these things in person and to go through this. Um, but every single time we do this in person and I, we usually break up into groups and I'd have you discuss and share your story and share what that means for you as a, um, as a once student, now educator. But you know, out of all of the times I've done this, there has not been one person who stood up and said, they had the best lesson plans ever. They really know, knew how to, how to teach those lesson plans. And I think that's something um, that's really important for us to think about. Lesson plans are very important. High quality instruction is very important for students' well-being. But students are gonna remember the way you made them feel. In 20 years from now, if they're sitting and talking and writing what qualities did somebody, did a teacher impact their life, they're going to remember the way they felt in school. How are we making students feel every day they're coming into our classroom? And that is something that is so important for us to sit and think about, especially going into this next year. How do I want my students to feel? How do I want students to feel who are even the most challenging students sometimes coming back into my classroom? We want them to feel safe. We want them to feel supportive, but we want them to have fun and to experience those new, again, those pathways and building up that area of their brain that maybe is not being built up when, while they're at home. Okay, so next we will move into how do we recognize the signs and the symptoms of trauma? Oh, okay, so I quickly just want to play this video for you all and please put in the chat if you have a hard time hearing it. My computer was letting me know there was a few issues with audio. Um, so if you have a hard time hearing it, I will just um, describe it to you. So this will be just about a minute long. A critical area for learning. And on MRI scans, we see measurable differences in the amygdala, the brain's fear response center. So there are real neurologic reasons why folks exposed to high doses of adversity are more likely to engage in high-risk behavior. And that's important to know. But it turns out that even if you don't engage in any high-risk behavior, you're still more likely to develop heart disease or cancer. The reason for this has to do with the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the brain's and body's stress response system that governs our fight or flight response. How does it work? Well, imagine you're walking in the forest and you see a bear. Immediately, your hypothalamus sends a signal to your pituitary, which sends a signal to your adrenal gland that says release stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol. And so your heart starts to pound, your pupils dilate, your airways open up, and you are ready to either fight that bear or run from the bear. And that is wonderful. If you're in a forest and there's a bear. <laughs> but the problem is what happens when the bear comes home every night. And this system is activated over and over and over again. And it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to maladaptive or health damaging. Children are especially sensitive to this repeated stress activation because their brains and bodies are just developing. High doses of adversity not only affect brain structure and function, they affect the developing immune system, 
developing hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. So for me, this information threw my old training out the window, because when we understand the mechanism of a disease, when we know not only which pathways are disrupted, but how, then as doctors, it is our job to use this science. relationship between adrenal axis, the brain's and body's stress response system that governs our fight or flight response. How does it work? Well, imagine you're walking in the forest and you see a bear. A bear. <laughs> but the problem is what happens when the bear comes home every night. And this system is activated over and over and over again. And it goes from being adaptive or life-saving to maladaptive or health-damaging. Children are especially sensitive to this repeated stress activation because their brains and bodies are just developing. High doses of adversity not only affect brain structure and function, they affect the developing immune system developing hormonal systems, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. So for me, this information threw my old training out the window, because when we understand the mechanism Hey, sorry about that restart. But yes, I saw a lot of accolades for Dr. Nadine Barcaris in the chat. She is incredible. And I cannot um, recommend going and watching any TED Talk or any video that she has put out. She is actually now the um, Surgeon General for California and really um, instrumental in the ACEs and trauma-informed uh, world. So I can't um, uh, recommend enough going back and watching that full TED Talk. She explains things and says words that um, I cannot. So she goes into a lot of detail. Um, okay, so really this fighting the bear is what we're talking about with trauma-informed schools. So going back to those three, um, three areas of the brain and how students are fighting bears every single day that they're walking into our schools or walking into our classroom. We don't know what bear popped up for them while they were at home. We don't know what bear popped up with them while they're walking through school or coming to school or just during the day. So again, going back to this, um, the slide of the brain, if you can think a bear pops up for a student, we know that the stress hormone cortisol is released. It starts flooding the brain, starts feeling, filling the brain from the bottom up to the top. And you have a student who is in their neocortex or limbic brain or survival brain. How do we know what area of the brain a student is in? Well, they're in their neocortex. If they're able to take in new information, they're able to learn new things, they're able to sit, do their homework, and um, relate and have peer to peer conversation. They're able to talk to you. You know, a student who is operating in their neocortex, if they're able to do all of these things. You know, a student is in their limbic brain if you see a lot of emotions, either high hysterical emotions or really low lack of emotions, completely numb or withdrawn. You know, a student is in their brainstem if they're in that um, fight, flight or freeze, that survival mode. You might actually see a fight in your classroom. You might see freeze. They're completely numb and withdrawn and their brain is actually telling them and shutting off all ways of communication in order to survive. You might see flight. Ever dealt with a runner? They just fly right out of the situation. That can be a trauma response. So again, a bear pops up for a student. They're triggered. That cortisol level is rising in their brain. They're in their neocortex doing just fine. And if you've ever heard the term, they just flipped their lid. It's exactly what you can think of. They flip their lid out of that neocortex, go into the limbic brain or into the brainstem. 
Now, if a student has a lot of experience with flipped lids or has a lot of exposure to fighting a bear, then the area of their brain creates that neural pathway. So they're more likely if they brainstem works for them, brainstem helps them survive to go to brainstem more easily or go to limbic brain more easily if that is what has worked to, um, to release that cortisol. Now we all have receptors in our brain that when the stress hormone is activated, the receptors take it right back out and you can work your way back up and go to the neocortex. A student who's chronically exposed or over and over to this stress hormone, the receptors become desensitized and it can actually sit there for longer and longer amounts of time. Those receptors don't work as quickly to remove the cortisol from the brain. So that's why everyone's response period or when they get back up to that neocortex can take longer, it can be a longer amount of time. It, every student, again, is in a different boat and every student's brain has adapted differently to what boat they're in. So their response looks a lot different in these situations as well. Now, what to hear or what to take away most from this slide is to know we want students in their neocortex, but to say 100% of your students are going to be in their neocortex 100% of the time is just a pressure you cannot put on yourself and you cannot put on your school either. But what a trauma-informed school is saying is we recognize flipped lids. We recognize when students are feeling dysregulated. We recognize when they're in that area of their brain and we have procedures and policies and practices that we put into place that help kids safely become regulated again, that help them safely get back up into that neocortex. If a student is in that dysregulation saying, sit down, do your work and sit there and be quiet. That is not a strategy that is going to take them from that flipped lid back up to that top. There are many strategies we can put into place that we will go into in the rest of this presentation. So here are some student statements that are fighting the bear statements that have stuck out to me in my career working with students. And they are just reminders of really what is going on beneath the student or what is going on beneath the surface for these students. I had a little um, five-year-old who walked up to me one time and said, you know, I guess I'll always just be a bad kid. And that broke my heart because this little boy had heard over and over and over that he's a bad kid. So he just started identifying, I'm just going to be, a, I'm just a bad kid. That's who I am. So being very mindful the way we speak about students and what they're picking up on from us as well. Before I throw books in class, I wish my body had an alarm telling me so I could stop. This was another little boy. Um, he was about seven years old, and he had a problem with throwing books and destroying the classroom. So he knew he didn't want to do this anymore. He didn't know why his body was acting in this way. And what I know now is he was operating in a dysregulated brain or a flipped lid, and he wished he had a body or an alarm in his body telling him when he needed to stop. So we went a little bit further into this and he identified that his heart started beating really fast right before his lid flipped. And so we said, there you, that's your alarm. That's what you focus on. So we had a special pass in his classroom that he was able to say, my alarm's going off and he could take this pass and do one of his regulation activities. For him, it was just walking down to the counselor's office, getting some physical activity, getting out of the situation and being able to move helped prevent that flipped lid. I guess I just wanted somebody to notice me. That is a lot of what I hear too. Oh, this is just attention sinking behavior. They just want me to give them attention. That's all this is. And you're right. A lot of times it can be attention seeking behavior. And if students only know how to get negative attention, they do things to get negative attention because that's what they are used to. So how can we redirect and give 
attention to students ahead of time so they're not flipping lids. Now you can see other statements on here that I'm sure you all have experienced as well and I'm sure a lot of students are popping in your head um, throughout the course of this presentation. So what are some immediate reactions that you see to trauma? You might see emotional reactions. You might see physical, cognitive, or behavioral reactions. These are all typical. So emotional, you might see anger, sadness, disorientation, um, or denial. Physical, you might actually see nausea or sweating, um, faintness, extreme fatigue and cognitive difficulty concentrating, disorientation of time, memory problems, behavioral, you might see a startled reaction, avoidant or argumentative, or increased substance abuse sometimes. So again, that's when fears are popping up for students. These are some of the reactions that you might see. Not every single student is going to have the same trauma reaction. All students are different. And again, it's just looking at the behavior and knowing that there is more going on there. Just like an iceberg, what we see in the classroom is an external representation of what is happening internally for students. So behavior is externally representing internal feelings. So if we can shift the way, shift our perspective that we're seeing students, that this is just an external behavior of what's happening, how they're feeling inside, then that is when we start shifting the paradigm of how we interact with students as well. So what are the steps to being uh, to a trauma-informed school? So we know we have to allow the student to de-escalate and regulate before solving the issue at hand. Problem solving cannot happen in the moment. Designate a quiet space for the student that they can feel safe, that they can de-escalate. It's never about the current issue. It goes much deeper. Think about what is really driving the student's behavior. We have an entire training that we're happy to come out and do with your um, schools on the function of behavior. Why are students behaving and what is the function behind why are they are behaving the way that they are? And we should match interventions or we should match discipline, um, teaching new skills based off of the function of behavior, not a one case blanket statement for all types of behavior. It's a brain issue, not a behavioral issue. Everything that we've gone through and why I love spending so much time on the brain science is because for me, that's when I started seeing students differently. I saw students of what was going on in their brains as flipped lids of rising cortisol levels. And that took my frustration out of the equation. The reason I said it starts with us, and that's the very first place we started in this presentation, is because our reactions to students it is what really feeds into the way that the situation is going to go as well. If we can take our frustration out, we can take it away from feeling like a personal attack to us as educators. That's when we start seeing students differently as well. It's a brain issue, not a behavior issue. We know that discipline is to teach, not to punish. If we only focus on punishment to change behavior, we are in a losing battle. Because you have students who say, punish me all day long. It has, doesn't affect me. Give me all you got. I go through so much worse than this. Just give me my punishment and let's get it over with. Discipline is actually teaching new skills, teaching new patterns of behavior. We're not just punishing, we are actually teaching. And to say, I hear a lot of times, I have, these are seniors in high school, they should know how to behave at this point. And you're exactly right, they should have been taught at this point, but we have to assume that they have not been taught the skills. And if they have been taught the skills, why aren't students using the skills to behave? We have to, again, look beneath the surface of what is going on and use discipline as consequences, not punishment. So it goes from he is so defiant to he is lacking social skills. I won't call home, they won't help. Calling home might get me some more insight 
And my all time personal favorite, I will not tolerate disrespect. And that turns into how can I help them learn respect? When I was a new teacher, or a new educator going into the classroom, I was a young girl going into um, an urban high school setting. And I was told immediately, um, you go in there, you don't tolerate disrespect or they're gonna walk all over you. So I went in with that mindset, no tolerating disrespect, zero tolerance here. I'm not gonna let students walk all over me. And I'll give you one guess how those first few weeks went for me teaching in that classroom. But as soon as I started shifting and I started really thinking about how do I help students learn respect? How do I tolerate, not only tolerate, but how do I accept students for who they are and teach them these new skills? My relationship with my classroom completely changed and we were able to get to a level that I never dreamed of in that short amount of time that we were together. So how do we respond? We have to focus on the whole child. So it can sound really big and really daunting, especially when we think, how do we set up a system that really incorporates all of these different strategies? Well, that's where we talk about a multi-tiered system of support. And schools using an MTSS really just set up the way that students receive services. So we know we have academics that can be in a multi-tiered system of support. We have behavior that can be in a multi-tiered system of support. We have social emotional learning that can be in a multi-tiered system of support. And as you can see in this graphic, when we have all three of those areas working together, that's when we're really focusing on the whole child. So when we're really focusing on the needs of the whole student. So we're not just looking again at instruction. We're not just looking at interventions for behavior. We're not just looking at um, lagging skills and social emotional development. We're looking at how all of these areas affect one student. So a lot of times you will see a triangle represent this MTSS or multi-tiered system of support. And that is what is most important when we're talking about trauma-informed classrooms or trauma-informed schools. So we um, talk about one, the first step, universal supports. What are supports that every single student in our classroom or in our school building are going to receive? Then we talk about um, tier two, which is some students. What are supports that um, students who need some more intensive supports going to receive? So these are students who are at risk. These are students who may have experienced trauma. These are students who pop up for us that they're on our radar and we know that they need a little bit more than tier one support. And then we structure our classrooms um, into tier three. This is the most intensive level of support for students. So those who are on our radar the most that we know they have flipped lids quite a few times. We can point them out. Um, we know exactly the students who need or we can go through screening measures, the students who need that most intensive level of support. Now, when you have this triangle working together, you make sure every single student in your classroom or in your school building is getting the level of support that they need. So if you have a strong tier one, that is going to um, hit about 80 to 90% of your students. 100% of your students will receive tier one, but it will be effective in all that 80 to 90% of your students will need. Now you will have about 10% of your students who do need a little bit more of those tier two supports and about one to 5% of your students who will need that those tier three supports. Now, if you start thinking of your classroom in this way, and we start thinking about a really high quality tier one system, and we know that that is going to meet the needs of about 90% of our students, that can really starts taking the pressure off of how do I have a trauma-informed school and make sure I'm meeting the need of everyone and everybody's trauma history is so different. We have to start thinking about it in this triangle. 
Now I want to make sure and explicitly say that a student who is receiving tier three support will also re be receiving tiers two support and will also be receiving tier one support. So they all build, they scaffold upon each other. And that's when you are meeting the needs of your students. So this is really a way to allocate resources and to allocate your time. You only have so much time to interact and to communicate with students. And this is how you can build your time with them. So we also want to make sure we note that schools are in a continuum. And just because you have one training or just because you know some strategies doesn't necessarily mean that you have a trauma responsive um, or a trauma or trauma responsive classroom or trauma responsive school. It is all along the continuum at all time. So we know that there are trauma aware schools, trauma informed and trauma responsive. And all of these different levels in this continuum build upon each other. So what should you really be focusing on? So going back to our triangle in our MTSS, there are four components to look at when you're building a trauma responsive classroom or school. Sustainable teaming structures, making database decisions, having evidence-based practices, and operating in a continuous improvement cycle. So we wanna make sure we have data of what students need tier two support, what students need tier three support. We wanna make sure that the level of support they're receiving at each tier is evidence-based as well. And those are the main things that you wanna look at when we're talking about trauma-informed schools. So what do we do for all students? What are those tier one supports? So we know school-based multi-tiered um, multi system of support and intervention really looks at this prevent, teach, reinforce, and respond. So what are we doing to prevent? What are we doing to teach, reinforce, and respond? Now think back to any classroom management training that you have had in the past or any type of classroom management you have. I know for me, when I was in the school, my um, immediate response or my immediate level that I was on all four was respond. I was really good at the respond, but I realized I had to back up all the way to the prevent. What was I doing to prevent those flipped lids? What was I doing to teach students about how they were feeling and how to regulate their emotions? How was I reinforcing that by modeling that behavior? And how was I responding in a trauma sensitive or trauma responsive way? So the very first thing to do is to um, teach social emotional learning competencies. So something that we're very excited about is that these will be um, coming soon to you all. And there's actually an engaged session that I cannot recommend enough going into more about social emotional learning competencies. The more we can teach students about self-awareness self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness, the more we are reaching all students on a trauma-informed lens. We're building up those skills that they might not have ever received in their life. And there's a way to incorporate this into your content area as well. And all of that, again, is coming soon. And I cannot recommend enough attending um, the SEL presentation um, tomorrow, I believe afternoon as well, but you might check your agenda. It's also about building up protective factors. We know that students have, who have experienced trauma have a lot of risk factors. So trauma, negative modeling, family school disruption, um, and discrimination can be on the list of risk factors. But what we can do as education is build up protective factors. So we can see academic um, competence, healthy habits, building up those social emotional skills and building up those self-management skills. So we know that if we only focus on risk factors, an ineffective response is reactive management. Exclusion, you're done, out of my room, lay your head down, we'll get back to you later. Punishment-based teaching. So just punishing and never explaining why um, 
how to have new patterns of behavior. Um, not having evidence-based practices. But again, what we know is the more protective factors, the more effective response we can have, it can actually um, level out that balance that we see here, that we have a trauma-informed lens on decision-making. We have prevention-based. We go back again, how do we look at prevention? We know we can't control what happened to a student outside of our classroom or what bears pop up for the students or what triggers pop up for students. But what we can control is the lens in which we see students, the support that we give students and having high fidelity implementation of that support. So the, there's a lot of studies into protective factors or what is called PACES that help balance out that, um, um, that beam that you saw. So some things that we know that help build protective factors is have somebody who loves you unconditionally, have at least one best friend, have an adult or someone you can trust and count on for advice. Um, and being involved in school and being connected to school. And just due to the amount of time that we have left, I will not go through all of these protective factors, but I encourage you to go back through because all of these protective factors can be built up in the relationships that you're building with students. Having safe relationships is so important when we're talking about um, how to make sure we're reaching and every single student knowing that they have a safe relationship in the school. We wanna make sure that we are empowering students and that we are sharing the power, not just using power and control in the classroom. Having consistent and clear routines is so important. Having your classroom expectations may sound very simple, but we also have to teach our classroom expectations. When you're coming into my class, here is what your ex expectations are. And that creates a more safe and inclusive environment as well. We're explicitly teaching how to behave inside each school or inside each classroom and making sure we have some trauma informed um, or social emotional competencies embedded within our classroom expectations. So this is a link to universal screeners that you can use. So at tier one, one of the most important things that we can do for students is universally screen to see who actually needs tier two or tier three support. This is a link that is on our website as well that actually goes through data collection tools for social, emotional, and behavioral um, that you can see um, within your students. How can I identify what students need those tier two or three supports? Okay, so just because we're running out of time and I tend to do that, I want to make sure I give you some quick strategies. Movement is a great way to know um, how to get out of that flipped lid and get a student back up into that higher order thinking, um, going to PE class, or even just incorporating some sort of movement in your classroom, allowing a student to get up and move around um, is a great way to release some of those cortisol levels. Music actually changes the wave patterns in brains as well, um, or white noise machines. So if you have a student who is dysregulated playing some music, you know there's, you start noticing a certain time of day that a student is more dysregulated than others. Music is another great strategy. Um, as well as regulation stations. So just having somewhere. We want to make sure we're teaching students how to recognize a flip lid. That we actually give them somewhere to go to regulate again. Okay, so um, the rest of this presentation that you will have access to, and I encourage you to go back through your slides, and I will record the rest of this presentation if you would like to go back through and watch, is what do we do um, for Tier 2 and Tier 3 support for students who have experienced trauma? So once we recognize them, um, how do we recognize possible triggers, as well as how do we um, implement evidence-based practices for those students as well in our classroom? 
So again, like I said, I will go through and complete um, the recording for this um, session. You're more than welcome to click through the slides at tier three. We know that these most of these interventions should be taking place outside of the classroom. So how can we link to community partners to help us um, with some of those practices as well? Okay, I can't believe in an hour and a half, I ran out of time to get through all of that, but that um, is probably no surprise to anybody who has seen me present before. So I will put um, the link to the, um, the link to your certificate here in the chat. And please feel free to stay on. I will stay on here for just a moment as well to answer any questions that you have. I will stop recording. So if you would like to come off mute um, and ask any questions, again, I will stick around for just a moment to do so. Thank you all so much. And I really, really appreciate um, you all listening to me talk for the last hour and a half. Have a great day and I hope you enjoy the rest of Engage. <laughs>